Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, more trade aid on the way, and without a finalized China deal, it'll help. But now there's a new problem. Plus, a new lawsuit blaming farmers for bad water could change farming policy nationwide. In Southern Gardening, they call them elephant ears. Gary says it's the next best thing to the tropics. And in our feature, we're off the highway once again. And where is Zach headed this time? Well, let's just say there's some real history involved. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. And as we approach Thanksgiving, all of us here on the Farm Week team wish you the very best. As we said at the top of the show, the USDA is planning another release of MFP sometime in the next two or three weeks, and that should go a long way toward easing the pain of the protracted Chinese trade war. But while those negotiations edge forward and while farmers still face a harvest that's well behind pace, there's a new problem on the radar. Peter Tubbs has that story. A normal fall is not like this fall on the propane side of things. A difficult harvest season has been compounded by a new problem, soaring demand for propane that has outstripped the capacity of the supply chain. Spring planting, delayed by rain, resulted in a late harvest. A cool, wet fall created a wet corn crop, making for billions of bushels that need to be dried with propane before storage. You know, norm normally we can probably you know, deliver uh, roughly about 200,000 to 300,000 gallons of propane in the fall. That's a good, good steady amount. Um, this fall already, we're over 900,000. Matthias Swartzkoff is fuels manager for Mid-Iowa Cooperative in Conrad, Iowa. His five fuel drivers have been busy sourcing propane from 50 miles away and delivering it to customers. 12-hour waits to load at terminals have been common, and deliveries have the drivers working 15-hour days. Demand is so high, Federal trucking rules have been waived in eight states during the propane emergency. While high demand and short supply has resulted in delays and short orders, there has yet to be a major increase in the price of propane. Currently, the price sits below the 2018 per gallon average. Some producers have brought harvest to a stop as they wait for their drying systems to be refueled, a bottleneck most hadn't anticipated. Corn growers looking to dry wet corn also have to accept they are a lower priority customer. Homeowners and livestock operators, neither of which can wait out fuel delays when temperatures drop, are at the top of the list. The whole upper Midwest, it's also getting cold right now, so um, a lot of my uh, marketers are trying to help also the homeowners, so there might be some short fills along the way to help everyone get some propane where it's needed. The only good news is that each bushel of corn that is dried brings farmers and distributors one bushel closer to ending the harvest season. You know, everybody's in the same boat. I don't think everybody's gonna be in the full capacity of deliveries that they normally make for the rest of the fall time. It's gonna be a new plan every day, and hopefully it's the right one. So as I said earlier, round two of trade aid on the way, USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue held a conference call recently, and the question came up, will there be a round three of MFP? It was, after all, part of the original plan. And while round three isn't off the table, Perdue made it clear he's hoping it won't be necessary. We are very hopeful that the China negotiations can come to a favorable conclusion. Uh, the numbers that we're talking about right now would be... Uh, uh, very beneficial to our agricultural producers, and uh, we're hopeful that, uh, that the trade would uh, supplant any type of farm aid needed in 2020 in that regard. And when we began, the, the mantra would they would rather have trade than aid, and that's what President Trump has focused on in uh, making sure that we reset these trade policies where our producers and much of the U.S. economy has been treated unfairly uh, through the years. Also discussed on the call, the USMCA still awaiting a vote in Congress. There's been plenty of pressure to get it passed, and trade rep Robert Lighthizer has been working with House Democrats to negotiate changes. Meanwhile, Secretary Perdue visited Mexico recently. He says our partners to the south are happy with the agreement. 
Well, obviously, they are very anxious to have uh, USMCA ratified. They still seem to be very pleased on their part uh, with uh, the provision of USMCA. They don't expect uh, uh, any major uh, changes there, and I don't think Ambassador Lighthizer does as well. He feels that uh, the issues that he's been negotiating with on the Democratic side are attainable and uh, can be done, and we're just anxious to get those things done sooner rather than later. I think uh, the later it goes, the longer it becomes possible to become entangled in uh, politics that it would not be helpful to uh, the agreement, and we certainly don't want to forfeit that uh, uh, on the altar of, uh, of politics in that way. In other news, a pot of money committed to the USDA's rural broadband program, known as ReConnect, will be divvied out next month. About half of the $600 million is pending to 27 broadband applicants. They must accept the USDA's terms before any money can be paid. Meanwhile, demand was high. Nearly 150 applicants requested almost a billion and a half dollars, and that's in addition to five other awards already announced, totaling nearly $50 million. And speaking of rural America, the CDC in a recent report confirmed what it reported two years ago that of the five leading causes of death, including cancer, heart disease, and stroke, more people tend to die from them who live in rural areas. A number of factors contribute to this, including leisure lifestyle, income availability, preventive resources, and diversity of health care. The report was published just days ago. It covers an eight-year period from 2010 to 2017. And that rule proposed in the retooling of the RFS blending requirements still has eyebrows raised. Several senators sent letters to the EPA expressing their concern about being able to trust the agency. One of them, Joni Ernst from Iowa, also tweeted her thoughts. She wrote, the RFS is essential to Iowa's economy and our farmers and producers are counting on EPA to ensure that 15 billion gallons means 15 billion gallons. 15 billion is the number of ethanol gallons the EPA agreed to net out annually back at the beginning of October. Two years ago, a major water treatment plant lost a lawsuit that alleged farmers were to blame for water pollution. If it had prevailed, it would have changed how farming was done nationwide. Many producers breathed a sigh of relief. Since then, though, two environmental groups have taken up the cause. John Torpy has more. Legal issues surrounding waterways in the Hawkeye State ran deeper this week as the Iowa Supreme Court announced it would weigh in on a lawsuit between environmentalists and the state. In spring of 2019, environmental groups filed a lawsuit against the state of Iowa claiming citizens' rights to clean water were not met due to pollution caused by runoff from farm fields and hog operations. The group's Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement and Food and Water Watch want Iowa's highest court to set limitations on the use of nitrogen and phosphorus on farms, as well as place a moratorium on continued construction of hog confinement facilities. Attorneys for the state argue the case could put years of Iowa agricultural policy on trial and would greatly alter current agricultural practices. Attorneys for both sides have 14 days to file their documents for review. On the lighter side, are you one of those homegrown gardeners constantly keeping your ear to the ground for landscaping tips? Well, we've got one for you, and here's a clue. It's not the elephant in the room. Here's Gary. If there's one plant that just screams tropical, it has to be colocasia, commonly known as elephant ears. Southern Gardening is at Truck Crops Branch Station checking out some new and exciting selections. There's something about the tropics that produce plants with large coarse leaves that make a bold statement in our Mississippi landscapes. Colocasia check all the boxes with their big leaves and big texture. Let's look at some that have become my new favorites. Black Sapphire Gecko features amazing dark black satin leaves on tightly clumped stems having a dark maroon color. When the wind moves the foliage, it seems to change color right before your eyes. 
The foliage of Dragonheart is variable from a dark velvety green to almost black. Maximus is an upright growing colocasia having bold purple leaves with bright chartreuse veins. This plant lives up to its name. Oh my God. And Tea Party is a pretty dwarf colocasia selection. The black leaves are cupped upward and quite beautiful in the bright sunlight. An interesting feature is that colocasia readily produce pups through the year. This is how the plant produces new plants. Be sure to grow in the full sun and provide consistent soil moisture. In fact, they can be grown in standing water. If you can't make it to the tropics, just plant some of these tropical colocasia in your garden. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, after a bit of a hiatus, we're off the highway once again with Zach Ashmore, this time to the Octibaha County Heritage Museum in Starkville, Mississippi. If you like time travel in a rural setting, you'll love Zach's story. The museum, which says it invented T-Ball half a century ago, by the way, will take you back. We're off the highway and we're styling with Zach Ashmore. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life, giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea. Extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. Before we get back to the show, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. Just one item, but it will be well attended, the 2019 Row Crop Short Course, December 2nd through 4th at the Cotton Mill Conference Center in Starkville. Registration is free until the day before Thanksgiving, and that includes all meals, including the steak and shrimp dinner. Don't miss out, almost 800 people attended last year. The 2019 Row Crop Short Course, for more information, call Kathy Johnson at 662-325-2311. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. In our market report, earlier we talked about harvest time being delayed by a propane shortage, corn just one of the crops affected. But with all of the talk about ethanol and certainly the weather earlier in the year, corn has become a hot topic. Here's analyst Naomi Bloom with a little more insight. There is high demand for corn right now because the marketplace is not used to this delay. Uh, we're 50% harvested, normally we're 75% done, and normally Illinois is pretty much wrapped up by now. So the demand is there, and with the drying being so slow, not only because of the delay in getting the propane, but also because it's so cold outside, it's just taking so much longer. So uh, we're gonna continue to see this harvest drag out, unfortunately, and that is also something that should keep the market supported. The other thing that is not being talked about and needs to be addressed is the test weight issue because that is lower than what the market is trading right now. So that is really something that traders need to be mindful of going forward. As everyone knows, we are still waiting for a trade deal with China, or at least phase one, as described by the president recently. Some say the deal could happen any day now. But in the meantime, as producers hope for a positive outcome, the market is moving back and forth. I spoke to ag economist Josh Maples about the China syndrome. Josh, over the last few weeks, because of the president's announcement that a trade deal in principle had been agreed to, there's been what seems like cautious optimism that there might be some light at the end of the tunnel finally. Uh, do you think that's true and how are producers reacting a few weeks into this so-called agreement? 
Yeah, so I mean, you're exactly right, Mike, and it was certainly welcome news to get something that suggested some progress was being made, right? It sure was. But it, it's one of those things where, you know, it's welcome news, positive news, uh, anything good is, you know, is a good thing, right? But if we look at like what the market participants, how they actually reacted to the news, it tells a story that they're looking for something more definitive. Uh, and so what I'm particularly talking about, we've discussed on this show before, mm -hmm. the sectors that are being hit hardest by this, soybeans is a big one, right? And, and so if you look at the soybean markets, futures markets in particular, you know, they didn't really react to this news. You, you didn't see a, a bump in prices that might suggest uh, traders and market participants, incl which includes producers, are, are really expecting a big price bump anytime soon. So I think, yes, optimism is true, but also waiting for something more concrete before we really see a big reaction. And as we know, it's a phased agreement. We, we were told that there will be at least two, if not three phases. Sure. Do you think there'll be likely pressure to get that f uh, first phase done before the end of the year? Yeah, that's, I mean, it, that's the question. And it's really hard to say with any kind of confidence. You know, I think there's been significant pressure to get something done for the past almost 18 months, you know, so right. it seems pretty clear that what is in the deal for each side is going to be more important than shooting for any particular target date. Uh, so I think that's probably my takeaway right now is it still matters what what's actually in the deal rather than uh, getting it done, you know, here in the next month or two. And at times it seems like both uh, ends of this deal. The people in both ends are, have retreated to their corners. Uh, China says it's also thinking about reducing import restrictions on U.S. poultry. Uh, what effect do you think that would have on the market? It would be very welcome news for the U.S. poultry industry. So we've been, sh U.S. poultry has been shut out of China since 2015 uh, due to an avian influenza outbreak here in the right. U.S. So right. Uh, it's not directly tied to the, the tariffs that we're currently seeing, but it's of course related. It's the same countries, right? So as part of that deal, the U.S. would allow some imports of uh, cooked poultry and seafood products from China. You know, this is good news for the U.S. poultry industry because there's a lot of products that we produce that aren't really in high demand here in the U.S., mm -hmm. but they are in high demand uh, in China. So that's why, you know, poultry... Uh, the poultry industry is, is really kind of open to this and, and looking forward to this potentially happening. Absolutely. How about the uncertainty of the China trade deal having an impact on cattle markets? Uh, demand has been up. Uh, there seems to be some optimism there. Or uh, the new agreement with Japan, has that mitigated that effect? Uh, yes. So the, the agreement with Japan is a much bigger deal for uh, cattle producers than anything that happens in China. We, we just send so much more product to Japan. So the, the agreement that is going to reduce tariffs for U.S. beef going into Japan is a big win for U.S. cattle producers and, and definitely overshadows what's happening specific to cattle uh, w with China. While there are increased tariffs on beef going into China, we just don't ship that much beef to China. Uh, so it wasn't a huge shift in, uh, in, in, in what was currently happening. Now, it's easy to make the argument that we would be shipping more beef to China, you know, without the tariffs, and maybe that market will be growing, uh, growing faster and growing bigger. Uh, but at this time, the Japan deal is a much bigger deal for, uh, for cattle producers, and we're just not seeing, you know, pr probably a very little impact from uh, the tariffs on, on U.S. beef uh, impacting cattle markets right now. As advertised, it's time to get off the highway again with Farm Week Adventure reporter Zach Ashmore. This week, Zach is sticking a little closer to home, but he found a little out-of-the-way rural attraction that will take you back in time. And by the way, have a pencil ready at the end of the piece. Zach will give you a way to reach out with your own ideas. Here's Zach Ashmore off the highway. Welcome to Off the Highway, a show where we explore hidden gems all across the state of Mississippi that you ought to know about. I'm Zach Ashmore, your host, and today we're sticking close to my hometown of Starkville, Mississippi. Today we're going to the Octibaha County Heritage Museum. Come on and join me. The Octibaha County Heritage Museum 
located on Fellowship Street in Starkville, Mississippi, was founded in 1976 during the United States Bicentennial. The doors first opened in 1979. Joanne Wilson's been volunteering with the museum for many years, and she gave us a brief history of it. The building is a, that we're in is a depot that was moved here from down by the railroad tracks down the road, and is a building that was built in the 1800s. The annex was added on in the 70s. The main entrance to the building is where they sold tickets for the trains. The display area you see here is where they stored supplies to be put on the trains. This museum covers multiple time periods dating back to the 1800s, when Octibaha was still a new and young county, all the way to modern day. It celebrates major events, people, and the life of this community, both urban and rural. One of the interesting things about the museum is that it's all volunteer run. We have one employed person and that is to take care of the grounds. But uh, throughout the state we have been looked at as quite unique to be able to function such a fine museum as this. Starkville was originally called Boardtown due to a nearby lumber mill that produced clapboards. After becoming the county seat, it was renamed to Starkville and has been growing ever since. The museum has collected many historical artifacts that originate from the area's business, agricultural, and manufacturing sectors. What is it? You're gonna have to come here to find out. <laughs> Although the museum is quite small, only covering three rooms, every corner is filled with local history and flavor. What we feel is good about this museum is it appeals to adults and children. We have the children's corner in the back where we have a fire truck for them to play in, a house, a dollhouse, which children don't play with dollhouses anymore. We have a typewriter for the, well actually the young people and the old people like the typewriter. We have a little discovery table with rocks and magnifying glasses. And we have a rotary telephone, which again is young and old. And um, then we have the exterior, which is not a playground, but is also a learning experience because the exterior the landscaping is an example of best practices in water retention. So not only do we have history, we have nature. When you come to small museums like this, you end up finding things out about the community you never knew, such as Starkville's where they invented T-ball. At least that's what they say. Octibaha County celebrates several sports stars that are from the area, along with major cultural and business figures as well. So, how do museums like this keep going into the future? I asked Mrs. Wilson what she thought. For me, I am the second generation to work with this museum. And what we need now is the third generation. Because we have some exhibits, say Lindbergh. You get the younger generation in, who's Lindbergh? We have wonderful I Love Lucy doll. Who was I Love Lucy? So we need, and we do have our museum board, which is an all volunteer group, is working on future planning of programming, of, of exhibits, and, and also try to get more up to date in, and that's the Hershey Hall clock. <laughs> that is the Hershey Hall clock, which was loaned to us by the Arnold family. Arnold, Mr. Arnold was part of Arnold Industry, which had Hershey Hall clocks. And um, this is one of the very special clocks that Hershey produced. All of the items in this museum were donated by locals, like this dentist chair, donated by the local Dr. Oakley. Uh, you might not want to see this. All kidding aside, there's so much culture packed into every nook and cranny of every small town in Mississippi and America. Museums like this one might appear to be tourist traps, but there's so much more to them than meets the eye. Mrs. Wilson summed it up in a really good way. Well, personally, I think Mississippi has a wonderful, wonderful, interesting history. And in order to appreciate that, museums collect that history, and hopefully we will understand the value of that history. Couldn't have said it better myself. Speaking of value, I always look for something special every time I go somewhere, and at this museum, I found a genuine 1800s top hat, and as you all know, I'm a fan of a good hat. Mrs. Wilson also has a favorite. It's probably the quick crazy quilt that we have because I've always been fascinated in crazy quilts because they were made from different fabrics. They pull the family together. They pull history together. Just, just the work, that's probably my favorite. And then the I Love Lucy doll. <laughs>
One of the cool things about small towns in Mississippi is that they tend to honor their heritage. You should check out to see if your hometown has a museum like the one in Octibaha County. Well, that's it for this week. But if you know of any places I ought to know about that are off the highway, send me a line. Who knows? Maybe next time I'll be off the highway in your hometown. Until then, take care. Thank you, Zach. Always one to find those little gems. And by the way, Octibaha is a Native American word meaning icy creek. Perfect for this time of year. Well, next week on the show, for farmers, a way to save their precious time. It's called the Wild Ramp in West Virginia, a kind of hybrid farmer's market, a venue that lets growers sell on consignment, cutting out everything but delivery time. In a part of the country where most farm part-time and work other jobs full-time, it couldn't be a better solution. That's next time on Farm Week. And before we say goodbye, one more reminder of all the things farmers have to put up with. A tweet from Stephen Drake of Dembeck Farms, about an hour away from New York City, who tweeted, bailing hay in freaking November. <laughs> Stephen said, like most farmers, he's usually done bailing hay by now, but thanks to Mother Nature, no such luck. We'll be hearing more from Stephen. One response to his tweet, someone who asked, are you going to hay until it snows? He said, either that or sell the cows. <laughs> Tough day at the office. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.